You're listening to Boobies and Newbies, brought to you by the Frolic Podcast Network. podcast that asks novice romance readers to think outside the dick in a box and brave the unbridled world of erotica. I'm your host, Kelly Reynolds, and it is time for another steamy spotlight interview. Seeing as we'll be discussing hot for Hollywood romances all September long, from the acting heartthrobs to talented directors and even a stuntman or two, it seemed only appropriate to dig a little deeper or behind the scenes, if you will, with one of our September authors, Alison Cochran. The Charm Offensive, available September 7th, marks Alison's rom-com debut. That being said, if all of her books are as charming, heart-wrenching, and emotionally charged as this queer love story, then I have zero doubt she's got a long career ahead of her. Here to talk about her new release, The Charm Offensive, please join me in welcoming Alison Cochran. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Oh my goodness, you are so welcome. And I totally forgot to mention that we're also going to be discussing, reading, reviewing The Charm Offensive as part of our Hot for Hollywood series. So that's coming up in September too. So this is like a two for one deal with Allison and her lovely book. Awesome. <laughs> um, thank you. I have to ask, why did you make me feel so many things? Like while re- <laughs> reading this book? Because it... Normally, it goes without saying that I I enjoy the book because that's how I do it on Boobies and Newbies. I try to select books that I want to promote and authors who I really love and I want people to read their books. However, anybody who follows Boobies and Newbies on Instagram will note that I absolutely 100% expressed my feelings about this book in an Instagram story because I just felt so moved to. And I don't, how did you do that? Um, Well, I'm a Pisces, so I think that's like 80% of it is I just feel a lot of things. Um, And so I'm all about the feelings. Um, And I think too, like this book, it was a weird writing experience um, where for some reason, uh, without meaning to, I kind of unfiltered, talked about a lot of very personal things um, and like disguised it as fiction. Um, And so I think that also is something that, I don't know, I just... I put it all out there, unbridled feelings. Yeah, yeah. I, and, and it's so funny because the book itself is also very funny. There's so many witticisms. Like I just, you know, it also probably was because it was coupled with the fact that I think I watched, I read The Charm Offensive and then immediately went and watched Bo Burnham's special Inside. Ooh. And that combination together <laughs> was both electrifying and also like made me, into a human puddle. Oh yeah. That seems like it would take days to recover for sure. (laughs) It's true. It's true. And we will get into, um, all the, all the details of this book, but first I'd love to, um, take you back. Although I don't know how far back we go because this is your debut book, which I'm, I'm very excited about, but I'd love to just sort of know, like, your origin story, both as a writer and a reader, um, especially as it relates to romance. So what's what's your relationship with um, both writing and romance been? Oh, I love that. So I have been writing uh, most of my life. I think I started getting really into creative writing when I was like six. Um, and then throughout my adolescence, I wrote a lot of like very angsty love stories. Um, <laughs> in high school, it was definitely of the like, romance fantasy genre like I think as a teenager uh YA fantasy romance really spoke to my my teen soul um and so that's what I kind of thought I had to write is is fantasy um though I don't think I was very good at like the fantasy part of that process Mm. but you know um enjoyed the love story part uh and then I didn't really um write books or like new books for most of my my 20s and so um this book was the first book that I wrote in a long time um and then in terms of reading romance I got really I have some early memories of reading romance books as like a teenager and feeling very sly um and sneaky (laughs) for finding them um 
but I didn't get really, really into the romance genre until like a couple years ago, especially with uh, like the wedding date by Jasmine Guillory. Good one. Um, yeah. Really hooked me in the kiss quotient by Helen Long. Like also um, a great one. <laughs> yeah. And finding like, Oh, like there are these romance stories that also deal with like mental health and also deal with like neurodiversity and just all these things that I uh, didn't typically associate with romance. And so that was really kind of eye opening. Um, and then I think as it became, uh, it's becoming more mainstream for queer romance to exist. It kind of, I realized I could write a queer romance. Um, and the story came out of that realization. A queer romance that also talks about mental health stigmas and neurodiversity. I mean, you just bundled it all, all into one beautiful package. (laughs) Yeah. Just shoved it all in there. I was like, what else can I fit? All of it. Hey, fine by me. Honestly, I will take it all. Nom, nom, nom. Like I I want (laughs) all of it. So, um, I, well, I know you mentioned Jasmine Guillory and, uh, and uh, Helen Wang, um, but I, I'd love to know uh, what are some of your some of your favorite um, you know romance tropes to read or um, a- anything you're reading right now. Um, right now, I'm actually reading a book that comes out in May. It's called Never Been Kissed uh, by Timothy Javonsky, and I'm loving it. Um, and it has one of my favorite. It's a new adult queer romance. It has one of my favorite tropes, which is second chance romance. Um, I'm just such a sucker for a second chance romance um, because they're usually so angsty and I love the (laughs) angst. I love enemies to lovers. And I was just talking to some people about this because like I'm a very like I'm one of those really intense enemies to lovers readers where like I want them to be like legit Legit enemies. enemies like somebody might get stabbed. Yeah, and it's, like, so hard to pull off in actual contemporary romance, but I'm, like, when it works, it works for me. Oh, I just love it. Yeah, sorry. There's, the drama. There's, like, a loud-ass truck outside my apartment, of course. Um, apologies no to anybody who's listening and hearing, <laughs> like, the loud sounds of, like, street sweeping. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I'm with you. I am all about an enemies to lovers. I feel like we need to separate enemies to lovers into, like, two categories, like the legit enemies to lovers somebody might die and or like get you know stabbed in the back but um and then also sort of like just like the tame like we don't really get along but we have to share a cubicle enemies to lovers sort of thing which I love both I love both of them yeah and in the group chat I think it was Courtney K who was calling it like dislike to lovers sure it's not like full enemies right it's just like they don't like each other and then you know they yeah. end up liking each other. Yeah, exactly. Um, you brought up second chance romance too, which I will say at first glance is not one of my favorites. And I think it's just because I, when I think about second chance romance, my thoughts are always like, you gave it a try. It didn't work. There's a reason it didn't work. Move on. There's a million other people out there. But at the same time, when it comes to like reading second chance romance, and I posted about this on Instagram recently, you have to like really consider the fact that like it's to write a romance is difficult enough, but to make characters fall in love, not once, but twice. That's like, I mean, that is really challenging. Like there's definitely the history built in, which helps, but because there's history built in, you have to like overcome all these things that you've acknowledged as problems before. And like, well, how do we handle them now? Di- you know, how is it different now as opposed to like the first time that we, we had our chance together. So I, I very much respect second chance romance. It's not my favorite to read, but I, I respect it and I respect anybody who writes it. Yeah, I agree with all of that. I especially love like queer second chance romance when it's like there is some element of like the queerness that kept them from being together in the first place, you know, and just as like for queer people as they figure out their sexual identity and like kind of those mischances that happened in the past. So yeah, I'm really into it. Yeah, no, it's, um, I'm, I'm, I'm coming around. I'm coming around. Yeah. I'll, I'll say, oh, I'll oh, say okay. that. <laughs> well, okay. Um, clearly the book you've written here, it's not so much a second chance romance, but what I have to bring up is the fact that you've set your rom-com in and around the world of reality television, which is one of my favorite things to talk about in any, any setting, any, any excuse to talk about reality TV and I will absolutely do it. So I have to know what is your reality TV catnip? I mean, mostly I watch 
like reality dating shows Great. pretty exclusively. <laughs> uh, unless like during the pandemic, I got super into the circle. Um, oh my that gosh. Was really. Thank you so much. It was so good. I'm just like, <laughs> it was like unhealthy every time a new, like I watched both seasons and it was just like all consuming. Yep. Um, that show hooks you in. Yeah. People who listen to this podcast will know they're probably like, oh God, Kelly finally found somebody to talk <laughs> about the circle with. No, it's true. I have you watched France and Brazil too? Like, No, they have, I haven't. Yeah. It's totally worth watching because like, okay. it's, I, I feel like um, I'm trying to think, I think it was Brazil. I, I really loved the like, it, it's really interesting just to see like the cultural differences like across the globe too. Just like they're so open to talk about like their sexualities and they're so open to talk about like their gender identity. I mean, it's, it's really interesting just to see like the differences between who's on each show and like what, what they, what's like quote unquote normal for them to just sort of like chat about, but oh my gosh, yes, I love, love, love the circle. And I just saw that they've been renewed for at least up until the fifth season. (laughs) Oh, thank goodness. Oh my gosh. Yes. I'm here I'm for it. Best. Yes. I don't know if you know, but I did for several years work in the world of reality television. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. And I definitely was more on like the competition show side of things, but it's, it definitely gives you an insight into like, you know, what's, what's going on. Like, um, and I, and I worked in casting and I worked in post-production. So it's like, I kind of got to see like, how you started off and then also like okay well here's all this footage how do we like bring this together into like a story because y'all there is definitely like a story and writing team for every every reality show and they work their buns off to put something together yeah (laughs) yeah I have mad respect um but there's definitely like that jaded side of me too that when I watch one I'm like Mm, I bet that was taken out of context. (laughs) Yeah. Oh my gosh. But you still enjoy watching it? Like it hasn't ruined it for you? No, I don't, I don't think it has. Like, I think for a while it kind of did. Um, cause when I was actually like working on it, if I would like go and watch a show that I worked on, I'd be like, oh yeah, you see that clip? Yeah. I pulled that footage (laughs) or, oh yeah, you, you see the little, um, the little, you know, lower thirds, like making fun of this person for this. Oh yeah. I wrote that like, ha ha ha. But then afterwards I was kind of like, Oh, I've ruined the magic. Like the magic's gone. Um, but you know, you know, you take a little break, you come back and magic's like, it never went away. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, I'm, I'm a fan. Um, I'm with you on the circle. What about, what about the dating shows? Do you have a favorite? I mean, favorite is a, tough word to use with reality (laughs) dating shows uh right because like they're all so problematic yeah I mean maybe someday I'll find one that I'm like isn't um but I still I still watch them obviously I still Mm -hmm. consume them Mm -hmm. um I have a like long-term toxic relationship with The Bachelor um as a franchise (laughs) and so like I I hate it I maybe love it sometimes. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I get pulled in like every time I think I'm going to walk away, I go back to it. Um, I mean, favorite ever, obviously like the sexually fluid season of are you the one? Okay. Perfect. Wonderful. I'm glad you brought that up. But yeah, otherwise I I watch a lot of them and even when I'm enjoying them, there's an icky factor too. Yeah. Are you the one is actually one of my like go-to reality dating shows. And when they did do, the the queer season the sexually fluid season like I really enjoyed that one a lot and it it kind of made me wonder and and I'll ask you this too is like if there is there a a reality show that's already in existence that you would want to see twisted in some way whether it's to add in you know queer more uh more queer representation whether it's to add in different different bodied people into the show or is, do you have an idea for a new show that isn't already out there that you'd like to manifest into existence? Okay. I'm not that creative. I wish I could say (laughs) that I had like a pitch for a like inclusive reality television show, but that is not my wheelhouse. Um, I mean, yeah, obviously I would love to see more like 
uh, body diversity in all television. Um, and like, there are, of course, other books, like If the Shoe Fits is, and mm. um, One to Watch that kind of tackle the lack of body diversity in reality television um, in really meaningful ways. But um, I think for me, like, yeah, I want all of them to be much gayer. Like, that's Always. one of the hard things, obviously, is that I love, like, I loved like dating shows, but um, <laughs> they are so straight yeah. um, and super heteronormative in sort of how they view love and relationships. And so, um, yeah, I'd love to see all of them get get gayer. Um, but because I yeah, because I've watched The Bachelor so much, like I don't know, The Bachelor is such an institution and has so much. I think kind of power and clout within the world of reality dating shows that I would love to see queer representation in the bachelors yeah and and it, it makes me so upset I'm, I'm not a bachelor fan and I think it's honestly for for all the reasons for what it's missing like because I yeah. just I'm like how many times can we re-watch the same thing knowing that nothing's changing like no, nothing's changing I mean like they had a black bachelorette great okay this is groundbreaking like this should have been groundbreaking 20 years ago like this this shouldn't be groundbreaking in like 2020 you know but um but yeah that's I I'm with you I (laughs) make it gay I I would love that but um I I just want to see a dating show where um and and here's the thing is it bothers me as like a writer and somebody who used to work in reality television that they have all these opportunities but they're missing them like that that show that came out recently um sexy beasts on netflix which <laughs> by the way i watched a minute of couldn't even get through it and i watched the whole first episode i felt pretty proud of myself honestly good, i i'm proud of you because i couldn't do it and i watch a lot of garbage um but i'm just like this is a show where you are literally making the statement like your first impression visual appearance does not matter. Like we are getting beneath the surface and you're still going to cast super model-esque, beautiful, like traditionally beautiful by European standards, men and women who, I mean, it just, it just feels like such a missed opportunity to not cast other people. Same with love is blind. I was yeah, like, love is blind is the same way. They're all conventionally hot. Yeah, I'm just like, where? where is everybody else? Where, you know, where is somebody um, plus size on this show? Where is somebody that's, you know, not a beauty queen from Nebraska? Like, I mean, there are just, there's so many, like, missed opportunities that I'm like, I've worked in casting. I've worked on these shows. Like, you, there are people who would do this. Like, I don't know what it's going to take, especially when you have, like, this entire fan base clamoring for change like why aren't you doing it and I guess the answer is just like because people will watch it anyway no offense I mean I know that like yeah (laughs) no I'm not offense it's true but it's I don't know and I mean I I will watch a lot of them anyway too um The Bachelor is one that I can't I think it's also because it's like such a long season for a show that I just can't commit to it's it's such a huge commitment it's (laughs) wild and like the season of the bachelorette just ended and now like bachelor in paradise is gonna start i just gotta roll right into that it's like four hours of content a week it's like a full-time job practically (laughs) i I, i'm like why why do i do this like why do i come back to be like disappointed and anger over and over again but there's something about i don't know i think too i'm such a sucker so many reality dating shows like you don't ever really believe that the cup, like any couple is going to come out of that dating show. Right. Like no. I love, are you the one? I love that sexually fluid season, but like at no point in time was I like, this is going to lead to like a lasting <laughs> commitment. <laughs> right. Like, and that's fine. Like that's fun. But I love that the bachelor, like never stops trying to sell that to you. That idea that like, this is re like, and even though you know, it's not real, you still kind of buy into it. Right. And they still have like, those rare exceptions, those rare couples that make it. And I think like, I'm just a sucker for, for a love story. So I like can get pulled into that. Well, and I'm going to take a wild guess and say that perhaps the inspiration for the charm offensive came in large part from the bachelor, because I feel like that's the same message that they're promoting on the show ever after in, in the charm offensive is very much like, you you could find the one like it's a very like Cinderella esque fairy tale ending, um, regardless of whether it's manufactured or not. Yeah, 
Exactly. Yeah. So that was a big part of it. And kind of also looking at like both from a romantic perspective and an idealistic perspective, but also from a critical perspective of like, well, what does that really mean? Like what kind of love are they selling? Is that, is that realistic? Is that healthy? So yeah, that is a, kind of a big part of, of the inspiration. Yeah, that makes sense. Would you mind um, setting up the charm offensive for, um, you know, anybody who has not been blessed enough to read an early copy like I have and now's the time to order your copy and get pumped. So um, would you mind giving a brief synopsis for what they can expect? Yes. So The Charm Offensive is about a reality dating show. It's about um, kind of a socially awkward and anxious like tech genius whose reputation has kind of um, come into question recently. So he decides to go on a reality dating show and like be the star, um, despite the fact that like, though he's conventionally handsome, um, he is not a typical reality television star. Um, and it is about how throughout the process, he falls in love with his producer, um, who happens to be a man instead of one of the women who have come on the show to date him. Yeah. Yeah. That, there you go. I mean, that, that was very concise. I mean, how many times have you okay. given this synopsis at this point? I mean, right? not that many yet, really. <laughs> like, only a couple. Yeah. By the time you're like three weeks into the release, you'll be like, yeah. I have it down to four sentences that I can yeah. read off in the matter of 20 <laughs> seconds. Exactly. I'm working towards that. <laughs> that was pretty good, though. No, well done. Thank you. Um, okay. So first of all, I do just want to mention to everybody listening that, um, Allison has done a wonderful job of including content warnings for the book on her website. Um, and I'm going to mention a few of them now, just because I think a a little bit of our discussion from here on out is going to relate to some of these topics. So if you feel uncomfortable in any way, I want you to make sure that, you know, you're taking care of yourself. This book very much talks about mental health. And so it is important to me that you are taking care of your mental health. So um, some of the content warnings include on-page anxiety, panic attacks, and experiences with depression. There are conversations surrounding OCD and mental illness stigmas, workplace discrimination. And one of the things um, that I also picked up on that I I really loved about this book, and I think this is something that came up a lot in 2020 when so many of us were either out of work or sent home to work or our work lives were really impacted – is the concept of like work being your worth. Um, and and I, I love that there's been so much discussion about that in light of the pandemic of realizing like, it's okay for me to go a day and not get things done. I don't have to like make this gigantic list and fulfill every element on it. Um, and having to post on social media that you've done everything on your list it is not proving who are you proving this to? Is this for you or is this for everybody else? So that was another one that um I guess for me that was like the triggering <laughs> that was the trigger for me um, because it's something that I also recognize in myself as as something to to think about and deal with. So yeah, work is worth that's a tough one for me. Yeah, it's a tough one for me too. And my therapist would tell you I'm still very much on a journey with that one <laughs> and breaking you know, I think like productivity as work is yeah. a, a tough one to unlearn because it's something that is instilled within us um, at a pretty young age. And it's especially difficult when I feel like you're not you're not working the what we've defined as typical nine to five, you know, that it's, mm-hmm. you know, you're a writer, you're an artist, you're a podcaster, you know what, you're a content creator. I mean, those people, like, let me tell you again, from watching Bo Burnham's Inside, like the amount of reaction videos I've watched where people are like, I'm a content creator and I'm watching this. And this is like very triggering for me because this is real. Like people don't realize this is work. Like I am working 24 seven, not getting paid for most of it too, like to do it. And so, um, yeah, like it's, it's especially difficult. I think when you're, when you're an artist. So, um, that's at least what I can speak to, but oh man. Yeah. I, again, so many emotions while reading this book. (laughs) As far as like when it comes to like discussions about mental health and, you know, the fact that we see we see our characters um, having anxiety throughout this book. We see Dev um, struggling with depression. We see Charlie coping with panic attacks like on the set. How is romance a good 
forum to discuss like some of the heavier topics because I think a lot of people have this misconception that romance is light, fluffy, happy, fun. And that can be true, but I think it's also a great place to have these discussions. Yeah, I think increasingly romance um, has become a place where we can kind of explore this fact that everyone deserves a happily ever after. I mean, happily ever afters are the guarantee at the end of romances, right? And it's a huge part of why I love them because I know um, that it's going to end happily. And when things are hard, right? When I'm in a bad place with my mental health, like that's what I want. I want something where there's that guarantee of like, when I close it, I'm going to feel good about what I've read. And I think that romance is a great place to talk about mental health because it's so prevalent, right? So many of us um, deal with anxiety and depression in various levels. And um, I think that showing that we still deserve happy endings, right? And that love is still totally possible because like, I, I think too, one of the messages we see a lot is like, you have to do all the work. You have to be like 100% healthy <sighs> to be ready to be loved by somebody else. And like, the reality is like, I have depression, like that's not going to go away. I'm doing the work, right. I'm in therapy, but it's not, there's no magic cure for it. Um, you and mean even when you I'm- find someone that's not going to magically <laughs> solve any problem that you have? It is not, <gasps> no, incidentally. And so you're, and it's always going to be a thing, right? Like you're always going to be doing the work. And so I think that you can always be doing the work and still have love is something that's important for me to see on the page. I agree. It, it also, it reminds me, especially when talking about, um, you know, depression or anxiety, like you said, this is something that you live with. Like this doesn't, it doesn't go away. Um, this is, it. I recently read a book that was about a, a recovering addict. And I, I loved that they specified like in the book, like I'm an addict. I'm always going to be an addict. Like, yes, I'm not currently drinking or I'm not currently, you know, on drug, whatever it is, like I'm sober, But this is this is something that I will always cope with for the rest of my life. Like I will always be an addict. And that that kind of reminds me of like when I am reading a book like The Charm Offensive, where they're talking about anxiety, depression, OCD. Like these these are things that, yes, you can take care of yourself and there's medication and there's therapy. But this is still something that is a part of your life. Like you are going to be coping with this. Yeah. And that's you know, I mean, being healthy is really important. And obviously that's a a big part of the book too, is making sure that you are doing the things, um, the doing the work to be healthy. You're still, it's always going to be there. And that doesn't mean you can't be happy. It doesn't mean you can't have love. And so I think that's something I really like seeing in my romance. I do too. And I, I talked about this on the podcast. I love reading like a more realistic contemporary romance. Cause to me, if it's contemporary I'm thinking, okay, well, this this has to like tie in then with like what I'm what I'm used to, what I'm I, I think of when I think of the world outside, like um, because if it's modern, that's my expectation. Um, so yeah. I love I love reading characters who are, you know, I don't even want to call them flawed because I'm like that, you know, if you suffer from anxiety or depression, that doesn't make you flawed. If you, you know, I mean, if you. Uh, if you're going through a breakup, that doesn't make you flawed. Like, I mean, we're all flawed in, in that sense, but also like, it just makes you human. So I love reading characters who are just going through like things that my friends and I are going through. Um, it, it makes it feel so much more realistic. And I think it's, I think that's what gives you that like emotional heartstring tug is because you're like, Oh my God, this is just, this is so real. I love this because of the fact that it feels so real. Yeah, exactly. At least for me, I know some people want the escape and I'm like, I know, yeah, that's fine. Like if you, if you want like the full fledged escape, I don't know. Can you really like have a full fledged escape in a contemporary romance? I guess that's the question that I'm wondering about. I don't know. I think, I mean, I think of so many books that were great escapes for me, but that did not mean there weren't moments of, you know, I think characters dealing with real life issues. I think of like red, white, and Royal blue, which is like such oh. a great escapist book, right? Like, yeah. um, because it's so far removed from your life. Like you are not the child of the president of the United States. Like you are not <laughs> going to fall in love with the Prince of England, but like it, it still is grounded in like real human emotions and experiences. And so that's true. That's, and you know what though, with that one, I do, I do think of it, I do very much think of it as like a fantasy because it's sort of like this alternative reality of like, what if 
a woman was president instead of mm, not he who shall not be named. And so um, I I don't know. I never thought about that. In ter- like that one has always been like, I know it's contemporary, but it has always felt like a fantasy to me. I don't know. That's tough. It's it's tough to think about because you if it if it's said in like this is the beauty of like fantasy paranormal you know anything that's set in another world alien give it to me monsters love mm-hmm. it because you can make up all the rules like I will buy into them in a second but like the second <laughs> you start challenging contemporary to me I I get very defensive because I'm like that pff, that's not real what are you doing that's that doesn't happen like wh- wh- what's going on <laughs> Yeah. Maybe I'm just a greedy reader. I No, I mean, like, I, I can understand, like, you want, if it's supposed to be real life reflected back to you, then you want to see yourself and your own experiences in that story in some capacity. Yeah, that's true. I mean, because clearly I am not Charlie, nor am I Dev in this book. However, I think there's a lot of, a lot of characters that people will find, like, a piece of themselves within, whether it's relating to, you know, Dev or Charlie's, like, struggles with mental health, whether it's, you know, this beautiful coming out story that Charlie has, which I also really enjoyed. Um, This is a conversation I've had with queer friends, is sort of the idea of labels as it relates to your, you know, sexual preferences of, like, do you find solace having a label? Like, do you find labels of, you know, helpful? Like, oh, I am bisexual. I am demisexual. Like, this gives me a community that I can turn to. Or do you, um, you know, kind of go the route that Charlie starts with, which is like, I don't know, do I need to put a label on it? Like, I don't know if I really want to be put into a box. Like, can't I just exist the way I exist and like who I like? Yeah. And for me, I have a very, like, complex relationship with labels. And so like, on the one hand, like I, I am a lesbian and I like love that label. And right now, like that is a label that feels really good for me. Um, kind of knowing that that could change over the course of, of my life, but I do find comfort in that label. But at the same time, I didn't come out until I was 33 and a huge obstacle for me in coming out was that I thought I had to have the right answer. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I like kept it inside of me for so long because I didn't know for sure. I I didn't have the right terminology. And I thought that if I didn't have the right label, if I couldn't come out and say like, this is what I am, this is what it's called. You can Google it. Um, (laughs) That if I didn't have that, that I would be seen as less valid, right. Or my sexuality would be questioned because I'm, you know, it was coming out so much later in life. And so I felt like I had to have that right answer. And that was really tricky for me. Yeah. Um, You know, and I, I also identify, uh, you know, under the asexual spectrum. So, and that's something that characters deal with in the book, but I don't know what the right label is. Right. Right. And and that's something I'm still figuring out, even though I'm 34, I'm still exploring. And so I think I find that labels can be both empowering and limiting and you kind of have to, I'm all about wearing them when it feels right Mm -hmm. and then ignoring them when it doesn't. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. One of my very, very best friends is a, you know, identifies as a bisexual woman and, we, we've had this conversation many times and she also, you know, didn't come out as bi until her late 20s. And she said that a major reason was not so much finding a label for herself, but finding a label that she could give other people so that they would understand like, OK, like you said, I can Google this. I can understand like my daughter is a bisexual woman. Now I can look up what the term bisexual means. And so it, it seems, you know, I mean, it seems like so much of. I can't say that's everyone's coming out story, but I, I'm, it seems like from the experience that I've had with, you know, friends and family who, you know, are queer, that it's just it's just as much about I don't want to say pleasing the world, but like making sure that like they they can find their place in the world and the world can also understand them in that place, which is so difficult. I mean, it's I it's something that like. I can't comprehend completely because I do identify as like a cishet woman, but um, just that it's a crazy, wild, terrifying, exciting journey, it seems like, to either find that label or not subscribe to it, to just sort of like discover like what your place is in the world and that it's not going to change regardless of like who you love. Yeah. (laughs) That's at least how I feel about it. I'm like, you love who you love. Who cares? If it changes over time, who cares? Like it's... (laughs) Do what yeah. you want, love who you want. It's it's it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. 
And I think that's hard for so many people, especially even within the queer community. I think it's hard sometimes to come out as one thing and then feel that like to, to continue to understand yourself better, to feel those labels changing and then to feel comfortable almost like you have to re come out because of course coming out is not a one time experience. It's, Mm -hmm. you know, a lifelong thing, but I think that can be really challenging as well. Yeah. The whole idea of having to come out like every time you meet somebody new, just, it just seems it's why I love it's why I love books like Red, White, and Royal Blue or shows like Shit's Creek where you just are who you are and you exist and people don't ask questions about it. They just are like, great, okay, cool. I like red wine. I like white wine. I like rosé wine. That whole conversation on Shit's Creek always kills me. But I'd love to eventually get to a point in the world, and I don't know if this will happen in my lifetime, of just people saying you know, this is my wife, this is my partner, this is, you know, in not having to like come out or introduce, you know, what what it is or who they're interested in every single time they meet somebody new. It, it should just be, it should just be, it should just be the way that it is. Yeah. Maybe that's like me living in like fantasy idealized <laughs> world, but I, I don't know. I just, I, I like to hope that, because I feel like if you go the opposite route, it's, it's a lot <laughs> It's a lot scarier and a lot more traumatic to think about it in the other way. Yeah, totally. (laughs) Now, I really love that in your author's note, you know, at the end, you talk about how writing the Charm Offensive was a a really therapeutic outlet, I feel like, for yourself, Um, you know, both as somebody who hadn't come out yet while writing it and then also as someone who, you know, basically had to check themselves in their own mental health. So um, what what did this book, you know, mean for you d- on that journey? Oh, yeah, a lot. Um, <laughs> so this book was a really weird writing experience. Like I had the idea for this book, um, like on a Wednesday. And then like the Thursday, I started <laughs> writing it. Um, and then I wrote the first draft in six days. Um, and it just like, poured out of me from this like deep place inside of me um I like didn't even have to think about it it just like came out ended up being this story like very much about mental health um and very much about gay love and then I wrote it was like "Uh uh-oh I need to figure out my sexuality immediately like Mm. this is telling me something like what I have written here and so it was really interesting the way that writing this book kind of prompted me to finally have conversations with myself and finally find um, you know, I, a queer therapist to, to work with oh, who nice. I could, uh, yeah. And like, oh my gosh, queer affirming therapists, like our lifesavers. Like I am, I'm so grateful to have access to like queer affirming mental health care, but yeah. And so it finally got me to that place, but also in writing the story and realizing that it was going to end with, with therapy and that like, it was going mm. to be about characters like going to therapy I hadn't been to therapy in like 10 years because I was basically avoiding confronting my sexuality which was something that I just like wasn't ready to deal with for my 20s and so when I wrote the book I realized like okay well that's hypocritical I can't have this character (laughs) like go to therapy I can't like write about therapy and be like I'm so pro like mental health treat like and those are all my beliefs but I wasn't I wasn't living my beliefs and I wasn't taking care of myself And so writing this book really prompted me to realize I needed to take better care of myself. Um, And also I needed to allow myself to find my most authentic self that became redundant, but you know what I I like, I got you. It gave me permission to finally be like, okay, it's time for me to confront, you know, the fact that I'm not straight, that I've known that my whole life, but um, you know, due to complex factors, like compulsory heterosexuality, I've had a very hard time coming to that, that understanding. So, Oh, the patriarchy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's like the the key word, you know, every um, Sesame Street episode, like the letter P is for patriarchy. Like, so yeah. I feel like I could I could weave that into 90% of our conversations about romance on this podcast. And that is yeah. because there's always been this like shame element and t- guilt element attached to romance specifically the sex part of romance and specifically as it applies to women, because so many of these stories are about, you know, women's pleasure and Ooh, how bad is that? You shame on you. So, I mean, it's, it's yeah, just take it on up the ladder. And at the very top is the patriarchy. (laughs) Always. (laughs) I am curious.
curious, um, when you decided to write this book, was it always a matter of writing two male heroes uh, in your brain? Like, did you decide it was going to be like a male, male romance from the get go? Um, I did in the sense that like I was, so it all started with like me thinking about, uh, the bachelor specifically Duh. and being like, gosh, like someone like me could never go on the bachelor. Like, you know, I have all these mental health things, even though I wasn't dealing with them. Like I do not look like a bachelor contestant. Like I, um, knew that I was questioning my sexuality, but like, wasn't ready to confront that. And so it kind of started with like, well, under what circumstances would somebody like me end up on the bachelor? And that was kind of how like, how Charlie's character came to be. But because I was in this like deeply closeted place, like the idea of writing about two women was Mm. like, not, not feasible for me. Um, And so, you know, I made the characters male, I think because I had the story that I needed to tell about myself, but I was really afraid of doing that. And Mm -hmm. um, disguised myself as like a hunky tech genius. Cause that seemed much safer. <laughs> like I could write his story and nobody would know that that was me. Um, except for now I'm telling people, but it was, um, <laughs> I think the, the way that felt comfortable for me to tell the story. And there were lots of moments, you know, after the, like, as I've become more confident, I can like say I'm gay out loud without crying, like all the things, you know, that like were part of my journey to get to the point that I'm at now or I kind of wish that my first book had been a female, female romance, but I'm writing one now and I'm so excited to be able I was to share it with the world. Say. And I'm, <laughs> yeah. In a much, I think better place with my own sexuality to kind of not be afraid to share that part of myself with the world. Well, and I'm, I'm excited now that you've, you know, had these conversations with yourself and your awesome therapist, it sounds like, um, that, oh man, <laughs> They are amazing. Yes. (laughs) That you can now be in like the healthy mindset to write the story that maybe you wish you had told the first time around, which, and that's not to say that people, I mean, like the charm offensive is fabulous the way it is. Like, I mean, if it had been two women, great. If it's two men also fine. Like I, I would have read it regardless, but I love that you are now giving yourself kind of like this second chance it's your second chance romance. Um, it to, is <laughs> to write this like, um, you know, female, female story. And so that has been really, and like, I wrote a different female, female story right after the charm offensive. Um, I still wasn't out yet, but I like was ready to like start playing around with that. But then the, the book, my second book, which is called kiss her once for me. Definitely. I feel like I'm in a much better place to, to be vulnerable in that sense. Yay. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I have to ask details about that one. Like, what do we have a release date? When can I add it to my net galley shelf? Like what, what's Ooh. going on? <laughs> Long time. You can add it on Goodreads. Um, <laughs> it is not coming out until fall of 2022. So probably oh. October. I know, but that's so about a year after charm. Yeah. Um, and so it'll be out then a uh, long time away from that galley, but uh, <laughs> it is a sapphic Christmas rom-com. <gasps> um, yes. Set in Portland. Um, and so, yeah, I am, I'm excited. It's also, uh, it's also actually a second chance romance. So all of my talking oh up my about gosh. second chance romances was self-serving as well, because I love, a second chance romance. This so. is where we tie in everything from our conversation again exactly. into one book. <laughs> yep. Just shove it all in there. <laughs> Pack it all in. And, and you threw in Christmas. I mean, if you can like write any book and then also say, you know what? What if we also just throw in a little bit of Christmas? I'll read it. <laughs> Why not? Why not? You know, like, I think <laughs> we all just want more queer, like Hallmark rom-coms, right? So Amen. let's just write them as books. There are so many amazing queer rom-coms coming out in 2022. So I am so excited. Yeah. And I think we still have a few to look forward to for the rest of 2021 as well. Like there's definitely, there's not a ton, but I know that I have one on my list from Roan Parish that I want to say is also a holiday romance. It is. Yes. That's the only one I know of right now that's coming out this year, but there might be others that I'm not aware of. I'd have to look back, but no, I'm very excited that this is... This is becoming, it needs, it, it's not a trend. It's beyond a trend. Like we, we can't call queer romance a trend, you know? I mean, it, it needs to become mainstream romance 
love stories being told about every single kind of person there is. I mean, if we're telling stories about fucking monsters, you better <laughs> believe I'm expecting to see two men fall in love. Like, I mean, it's it's beyond my expectations. Like, it, it needs to be part of our reality. And I love that publishers are finally making it a part of our reality. Yeah, there are so many people who've been writing queer romance for so long. Yeah. But it's been that those stories have only been published by, like, a very few, like, niche, um, you know, boutique publishing houses. like Or indie. Um, yeah, and they just haven't had that wide um kind of that wide reach and yeah. so we just haven't um like for me I didn't know that those romances existed like mm. had I been reading queer romances alongside you know hetero romances or if I'd had queer YA fantasy in high school mm-hmm. you know which thankfully teenagers have today yeah far more access to those kinds of stories but that representation could have made a huge difference in my life and so I sure. think seeing more mainstream uh, people having access to more queer romance is yeah makes me very happy this is why I love a lot of indie romance is because I feel yeah. like there's a lot that they can talk about that aren't necessarily being traditionally published however I mean the charm offensive is a great example of something that you know several years ago I never would have expected to see traditionally published like a story a queer romance, let alone a queer romance talking about like mental health. And, you know, I mean, there's so, so many layers in this book that it's, it's incredible to me and also exciting to me that this is something that we are seeing in the mainstream now. And that I'm like, if this is what we've got, then this is like the new bar that I'm setting that we need to have more of this. So um, this is me you know, on my soapbox, holding publishers accountable for what they can do because they've done it here. So I want to see more of it. Yeah. Manifest it. Manifest more, Mm. more queer romances. With Christmas. More Christmas. (laughs) More Christmas. Yes. (laughs) I love it. Well, I guess I'll start planning the 2022 12 Days of Boobsmas special that we do in December. Oh my gosh. (laughs) I love that. Yeah, we're calling it the the holidays because (gasps) there are so many of us that have gay romances coming out. Oh my gosh. Uh, queer romances coming out in 2022 about Christmas. And that is fantastic. not Christmas. A couple of them are also um, like with Jewish main characters. So. Well, even better. I mean, like that's fantastic. I, I would love to, you know what my favorite, um, we do the 12 days of boobs Miss special every December. And um, I think my favorite read, read last year for the 12 days of boobs Miss was about the holiday Yule. And I was like, this is incredible. This is like a witchy, Christmas but like it, it's about like the the elements and the earth and the nature and I was like this is really hot like I'm really enjoying this and there was also like um a lot of like found family and like there were queer characters I was like where where has this book been like my whole life like I need more of this like I didn't know there were books about Yule yeah what is this book called how do I find it a very witchy Yuletide I love it a very witchy Yuletide by D. Lieber um, and I had my friend Annie on who is a, you know, certified witch um, and runs this awesome like online apothecary that she calls the Hex Apothecary. But um, yeah, so it was it was a very witchy in December podcast episode and we loved the book. Um, but yeah, I, I want to see I want to see all the holidays. Well, I'm excited for your next book, which I have to wait a long time for. I'm excited for everybody else to read the Charm Offensive because I think like we said, there's there's a little bit of something for everyone. Like you will find a piece of yourself in somebody in this book. I challenge you not to find a piece of yourself in somebody in this book because it's so relatable. So um, I know we have a while to wait until the next one, but um, I'd love to know, and maybe, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself because, you know, this book is just coming out now, but is there a story that you're dying to tell? Like the dream project that just lurks around your brain oh my goodness I have a couple I have a couple dream projects that work around my brain um I am I love that you're doing a a Hollywood month because I always come back to these like stories about uh you know like gay pop stars like I really want to write a gay pop star book um yeah there's something so fascinating I think too about about the world of like uh I think reality tv is fun because we get the world that they want us to see. And we know that that's 
even though they're calling it reality, it's not what's real. Um, <laughs> and I think it's fun to peel back the layers and kind of think about the lives that we don't see. So those are my favorite kind of stories. It is funny that we know that. Like, I mean, we know and acknowledge that. And yet everybody's still very invested in watching reality yeah. television. Like that there is like, that's an art. I mean, to know and like to basically market like, we're going to give you the story we want to give you, even if it's not true. Like, and for people to still tune in and know that and love it and watch it. Like there, there is something very powerful about that. (laughs) It's wild. It's wild that we let that we're like, this is reality television. And like, we know it's not, we see that over (laughs) and over and over again. Um, It's a black mirror episode. That's what it is. (laughs) Which I also love. Um, that's- I have never seen Black Mirror. Yikes. Confession. Okay. Um, I know. If you, um, hmm, it's okay. But did you see Bo Burnham's Insight special? I've only seen the first like half of it. I know. I'm so sorry. Okay. Like it's, it'll make you feel very similar things where um, yeah. you'll be like, wow, this is um acknowledging a part of my life that could very much be this real. Like I, it, it plays yeah. on technology a lot. So more so than ever, it's one of those shows that will make you think, oh, my God, this could happen. <laughs> yeah. OK. <laughs> so um, be prepared. Be prepared. And you know what? It's one of those shows where it's like you don't have to watch every episode. Like you can watch whichever ones you Skip want. around. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But yeah, just another another dark recommendation for you to Love. enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> have to be careful with those dark recommendations. I'm always like, ooh, I got it. My mental health. Got to pick yes. and choose. If you do and then t- like, yeah. rewatch Kids Creek in between, you know? Oh, yeah. Except <laughs> if you do decide that you're going to watch Black Mirror or Bo Burnham's special, like, just make sure you follow it up with like either Shit's Creek or an episode of Are You the One? I mean, like, th- yeah. <laughs> these are the Perfect. things they need to complement each other to make sure you go to bed and don't have like, you know, scary, scary <laughs> dreams. <laughs> Excellent. I'm on it. <laughs> All right. Well, I think it's just about time for us to wrap up, Allison. But I, this has been delightful. And I, like I said, I'm so excited for people to read The Charm Offensive, which is available as of September 7th, if I believe. And yep. you can pre-order your copy. You should pre-order your copy. I talked to somebody yesterday and convinced them to pre-order their copy. <gasps> <Yay>! <laughs> because um, I... I mean, I don't, I know there's still a few months left, but I will say this is one of my favorite reads of 2021 thus far. So, um, I, it, it hit me in places I wasn't expecting and I guess I needed, I guess we need those, those reads occasionally that you just don't expect to emotionally destroy you in the best way possible. (laughs) Um, but yeah, this was, this was that for me and I, I guess I did need it. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for reading. I'm glad that you were able to connect with it. Yeah. Well, and I'm glad that we live near each other in the Portland area because I, know. I guess we're going to have to get together for like bachelor watch parties now. I mean, or other other reality <laughs> dating shows that you actually enjoy. That's also fine. <laughs> Boobies and Newbies is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. You can follow Boobies and Newbies on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Boobies Podcast.